it's a it's an interesting transition that uh, we've been going through in the last maybe two three decades and uh, i've been in the it industry now this is my 30th year so being here for so many years uh, we've seen the transition that's happening in front of us so at a time when i entered we probably were reporting to a baby boomer generation whose thought process was a lot about loyalty right so i don't know how many of you would have maybe grandparents who have worked for let's say hal or tvs right so the reference would be uh, oh yeah call tvs srinivasan oh no 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 get uh, uh, gic uh, narasimhan so the reference would be with the name of the company and the successive generations also found a loyalty factor yeah i work for india cement yeah, i also work for india cement i got a job there so that was the predominant factor i would believe in our previous generation was loyalty in our generation we are all i'm a gen x so for us the primary factor was how do we how do we bring some stability because we saw too many things change in front of us and the entire uh, concept of a government job versus a private job the question started coming up in our generation so for us uh, like said <laughs> started was the advice of my father the right thing because my father was in in courts for 37 years he retired as a joined as a pun and retired as a gazetted officer right so is that the right advice is that what i'm heading for is that my future or with the changing environment shifting sands the rug is being pulled from under my feet how do i jump before it gets pulled so my considerations were different so i wanted more stability and that's what our generation saw because the 90s and the early 2000s and even now is that change so for us to vibe well with uh, with baby boomers generation there needed to be a good understanding of each other and get to the point where we became managers and we started managing the millennials now the millennials were born in the internet era or at least at their at their growth ages they are uh, they are in the internet era for me i saw the internet happen in front of me would you believe if i say that one ip vsnl connection was 30000 rupees in 1995 per month 30000 rupees how many of you would believe that i waited for four and a half years for a telephone line at my place <coughs> landline telephone line you don't wait for four and a half minutes to get a sim card now right <laughs> four and a half years so that transition happened and the millennials they loved challenges they loved to go and challenge establish equilibrium challenge boundaries now we were hesitant as a generation i was hesitant to challenge certain established conventions but the next generation started to challenge they liked to be challenged and they hence challenged as well in equal measure so what was loyalty and compliance with my past generation transitioned into questioning everything now questioning everything does not necessarily mean insolence or or insubordination it means they want to understand it means they want to identify with what's happening so that mindset change i had to bring in myself and now with you people the gen z should i call you most of you would be would be the generation z i think your life is going to be all about adventure your life is all about adventure you're going and figuring out new things for us to flourish as an economy as a as a society as a country so look at how loyalty to stability to to uh, challenges to adventure we have shifted completely from one end of the spectrum to the other from blind subordination and compliance to adventurous pursuit of things that's the transition that we are going through so as long as we are able to internalize this we definitely can handle people relationships better so this is my view there's a misconception amongst generation x and few baby boomers at times not all the time um, that just merely by virtue of the number of years of experience they have that they have put in uh, they have more knowledge right but that's not always right uh, it's all situational it's environmental so the the, the generation uh, y and the generation z uh, they have been exposed to a lot more uh, just merely by virtue of the environment and they may have found faster and better way of doing things so um, in spite of all this what happens is in a work environment uh, the generation um, 
the generation uh, X and the baby boomers tend to get intimidated when the youngsters can find solutions faster and quicker and uh, probably more effective solutions. And they also get intimidated when they don't approach them for help. Uh, on the other hand, the youngsters tend to get intimidated by the fact that uh, the baby boomers and the generation X would like to lead them or uh, they would like to micromanage them. So it's not an easy situation. Uh, is this is this something to do with uh, understanding each other's psychology better, or how how do you analyze this situation? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, further to what Sridhar said, uh, let's understand how this uh, happened. You know why these different generations and different perspectives and aspirations and motivational factors because with the onset of revolution. Uh, from uh, say industrial revolution, then we have information revolution, then we have social or digital revolution. So what happened, even the aspirations, uh, educational and professional aspirations changed. You know, there was a surge in that because of the opportunities that were available from, you know, uh, people from smaller villages and, you know, they came out into the cities and you see the kind of opportunities that have actually opened up and from uh, thinking about the baby boomers, um, uh, what kind of opportunities they had, they had no goal, right? So they had to actually depend yeah. on that job and that company <coughs> because of, you know, less opportunities basically. It is more of survival as Sridhar rightly said that that time for baby boomers and it is joint kind of joint families and they have to take feed so many mouths, right? They take care of families. So for them, it was only about work, you know, it was more about survival, just let's get through this and you know, they kind of dedicated their entire life into, for now, you know, they have, uh, you know, dispensable income and they have opportunities and they can take risks because think of the opportunities now, you can start your own business, you know, a uh, startup, you know, ecosystem has grown so much and there's so much support. And uh, in, there's also investments coming in, you know, there's so much opportunity, so much happening. So the Gen Z and uh, Gen, uh, you know, Y is all about uh, quality and they want to live a good life and, you know, they, they want fun and they want uh, um, uh, everyday challenge and, as you said, adventure. They, they really want to live life, you know, king size, isn't it? Am I right? <laughs> so uh, this is how you change, you know, a change in the aspirations and uh, I'm sure uh, they all are enjoying having a good time and uh, they all also pros and cons as I told you, you know, now they are like left in a big, you know, wide ocean now unless they understand what they really want, you know, it's very difficult, you know, because it's like going into a mall and you, and you don't know what you want, just imagine you will just be roaming around the mall because you don't know what you want to get, right? So, but if you really know exactly, you know, I want this brand, this color, this thing, it's so easy to go and find something what you want. So, it's so important. That's why, even the, you know, emphasis a lot have been also on personal development, understanding themselves, self actualization, because it's so important to know what you really want and what you want to do in the future. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I think from a headhunter's perspective, Vijay, just adding to what Dr. Shama just said, the frog coming out of the well and getting onto the ocean now. <laughs> Right. Is it also uh, related to uh, uh, the economy moving towards gig jobs, more freelance jobs coming, project based jobs coming and a lot of volatility in the market also because of which there is heavy attrition and people looking for jobs very frequently compared to maybe 20 years back. Yeah. Is it an uh, increase of opportunities or is it because of the change in dynamics in the market? First of all, uh, when we talk of uh, baby boomers, uh, then you have Gen X, Y, Z. It was like, it was only work, it was like God. Then became life, which is life and work balance. Then became fun. Work, life, fun. And then now it is called as futuristic. What is there to be in the future? I would, uh, from, from that perspective, you see. Going forward, the future is towards uh, more of uh, gig jobs. This is one trend that we are seeing across all the industries and one. And you may have, uh, going forward, you may have one employee working for three, four companies. This employee loyalty to one company, this loyalty factor will go away. The stability factor will go away. Uh, there were days 
when if you're a mom stunner, getting a girl itself will be very difficult. <laughs> that's the reality. But today, Good one. Uh, that's the reality. Uh, today, I, I could see my uncles getting, you know, they said I got married only at 35, 38. Yeah. I was trying to be an entrepreneur. But the same entrepreneur is an old while ago for all startups. Startup is a word. And a failed entrepreneur today is weak, is in hot demand. Failure is seen as success. Failure is seen as an important ingredient in, the, in, in any any organization. We've got a couple of instances where uh, uh, promoters are coming and say, hey, I want, I'm looking at uh, hiring a key member. Try and get me a guy uh, from a millennial uh, or a, a Zen Z who has been a failed entrepreneur. Because he comes up with a uh, lot of, you know, he, he's now tested, tried, he's burnt his fingers, he knows what to do and what not to do. So going forward, the future is going to be uh, get jobs, contracts to hire, the permanent, the concept of permanency is becoming uh, uh, is becoming very temporary, actually speaking. And uh, you are asking about is it the number of jobs or is it is it uh, ambiguity about it? Uh, it's a combination of both. Yes, there has been opportunities, but there has always been challenges. You always see companies talking about I've got positions, I'm not able to get candidates. <laughs> Always, you have n number of candidates available, still there are a lot more positions getting vacant in the organization because they are not able to get the right skills. And there is, it's a larger skill management, mismanagement or skill development, I don't want to get into that. So the ideal way going forward is going to be gig jobs and this is going to be ruled uh, by uh, Zen C. And, uh, but this will become an order of day even going backwards towards the respect to Zen, uh, Zen X and Zen Y. Recently, the mature talent is also in demand and gig jobs doesn't mean it is towards one particular segment or one. It's addressed towards one, only one particular uh, uh, age group. In fact, I have got CTO, uh, organizations asking for CTOs and uh, CFOs to be gig jobs. They come, they offer solutions. There are, I, in the IT industry also, you can see, <coughs> I would say A, B, C, D is ruling the roast. That is artificial intelligence, big data, cloud, and digital. And on top of it sits the security. So this is how I would like to look into it. If you see in this web, this is dearth of talent available, literally dearth of talent, we could say at least for the next three to four years, about two to five that people will be required in terms of digital. And uh, recently, if you see organizations saying about 15, 15 years of experience, people you now they have become uh, not so relevant to uh, the newer technologies. He has been working for 15 years, he has been found competent. One day he becomes non performer No. He has been performing. That's the reason he has been there in the organization for the last 15 years. But he has become technologically obsolete. He has become technically handicapped for the new technology. So, as long as you are uh, equipped, an old technology, you've been an entrepreneur or you've been an employee, and the future is going to be gig jobs with your newer skills and you can offer, you can act as an SME in for an LP organization, and that is welcomed. Um, gig jobs actually uh, are very welcome because it gives diverse expertise in terms of self actualization for an individual, and by the same token, <coughs> the organizations tend to benefit because of. Uh, Wider perspectives that one can offer. Yeah. Right. I'm not so sure that those kind of jobs are the right answer or they are the best. And since we're sitting in the college, I can say, what is the difference between a professor who is here in college versus an adjunct professor who's a visiting lecturer? There is a there is a certain a certain degree of involvement with the with the students. The I would say that the the non-tangible parameters like an involvement with the student, participation with them, working after hours and helping them, helping them up-level their skills or helping them with an examination question, a person who is time-bound will not do. So in that sense, I believe there are merits and demerits both sides. Now it entirely depends upon the organization as to how do they want to employ the resources and what's the kind of balance that you want between these kind of uh, skills that you need versus the kind of organizational construct that you need. So that's the balance which the organization has to bring. I'm not sure that entirely it will go towards 
a geek kind of a job. Right. Just my view. But the percentage. It's a classic Gen X speaking. Right. 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 Yeah. So then maybe a quick question to the audience. Uh, I know it's too early to answer this, but can you imagine uh, hanging on to a single job for let's say ten years at a stretch? Oh <laughs> <laughs> Expect okay, be careful. I got to one wife or one husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it also has to do with uh, you see uh, Gen X and Y. They're more into instant gratification, and they get bored very fast. Right, you know? right. So there's one thing which the HR needs to keep in mind, and they really need you know challenge uh, culture and um, you know. Very something true. you know the jobs which are very aligned to their core you know values and um, core competencies that's what they will go to enjoy in the future right that, that's that's correct and i think i'll i'll give you all of you an example <laughs> when when we were your age and i was your age we used to have one television channel <laughs> you like it you like the idea <laughs> no but no color tv i had a black and white tv as a tv you had the tv from from my 11th standard i had a tv yeah, yeah you like with that before that before that it used to be one tv in the street yeah so we all used to get together on a sunday evening in somebody's house to watch the movie together right and that movie if it happens to be a 1932 movie which you can't identify with and a baby boomer or a pre baby boomer enjoys that movie your weekend is finished and you have got to wait for the next weekend how do you like it right so that was but, but the point i was making was whether it was radio or television there was a 6:30 to 9:30 or a 6:30 to 10:30 kind of a program schedule and there was a half an hour program for let's say children there was a half an hour program on current affairs there was a half an hour uh, news there would have been a half an hour farmers program and you we used to have uh, there was the most famous incident was either the chitrahar at 85 on a wednesday evening where all hindi songs would be there or the equivalent in the regional language which used to be on friday evening at 7:30 and yeah and and the biggest was the world this week when ndtv started in 1988 world this week upon menon 1988 night 9:30 friday i would not let anyone touch and get anywhere close to the tv because i would want to see that but we were happy with the situation when somebody regulated my time somebody regulated what was available to me and my generation saw the transition in front of us and you people do not know what it means because all the control has shifted from the regulator to you all the control is with you in your remote now if you choose to see only one channel you are guilty of limiting your choices the choices are plenty and and ironically a 604 channel in tata sky is left which is left of center which is ndtv and a 616 is the public which is right of center so you got the entire spectrum from left of center to right of center if you choose to see only one you limit your views you limit your perspectives so the choice has shifted from the regulator to the consumer now it's up to you how you regulate how you regulate your time how you plan your choices and how you succeed with it so that is the biggest change that has happened in the last 25 years in my view the control has shifted to the person right so i think the freedom rests with you as shridhar has uh, rightly put it shridhar i have another question uh, especially in the corporate environment so when we talk of a divide uh, amongst the generations uh, we are not just talking of a, a digital divide of course we have the digital divide because uh, the baby boomers probably some there are some, many of them who are still struggling to get tech savvy and uh, there is the generation x that's uh, probably very tech savvy with internet but still not so social media uh, centric and now there is the generation y uh, who are growing up in that era and uh, of course the z will have the dna in them um, so it's not just the technical uh, it's not just the digital divide it's also the social divide Uh, there are people who, um, the the baby boomers and the generation x we have all probably uh, witnessed at least to some extent a joint family environment right. so we are more uh, <coughs> tuned to uh, living with many people around us we we get more tolerant we get more empathetic so the ones that are now growing up are mostly in a nuclear family yes 
So, uh, and with technology overpowering them to this extent, uh, don't you think that they somewhere uh, grow up as individuals and not as uh, the sense of belonging to a community? Is that getting compromised? Okay, my personal belief, most certainly no. Most certainly no. And and when and this is this is an awakening which has come to me over the years. Okay, if somebody throws that at you, take it to the pinch of salt. Right? I'll tell you why. Why was a joint family or having to learn from people in your close proximity, why was that important at a certain point in time? Because we were so confined to geographic boundaries. We were so confined to the street that we lived in, to the locality that we belonged to. So for example, if it is Malayshwaram, you know what it means in Bangalore. If it is Rajajinagar, you know what it means in Bangalore. Can you say the same of uh, Whitefield or uh, Electronic City? You cannot. So the, the shift has happened from being geographically and physically confined to actually, like I said before, breaking boundaries. Now, technology has enabled you to break boundaries as much as how companies, not just humans, companies which were geographically competing against, let's say, who was in Pina, industrial estate, used to compete with people in their close vicinity because they were all sourcing from the same people, they were all selling to the same people, and ultimately they were defined by their geographical boundary. Today, a company here is contesting against a faceless company in Indonesia and another one in probably Vietnam. So, the, the geographic boundaries, the physical limitations have been removed. So, what happens hence is the availability of technology has to bring about this, uh, I would say, bonding. So, to your earlier point about baby boomers and Gen X, right? Many of the baby boomers, I do not know how many of you know this, many of the baby boomers I mean, who are all in their late 60s and maybe even early 70s, some of them. Do you know that all of them are out now on Facebook and WhatsApp? You know why? You know why? Any answers? Because they want to stay connected. Stay connected. That's the easiest answer. Anything else? More exposure. More exposure. So what else? To what's going on. What's going on. Okay. Why? Tell me more. Tell me more. That's true. So what has happened is a lot of Gen X went abroad mm -hmm. and some millennials have also gone abroad. So their grandchildren are there. The biggest duty that most of baby boomers today carry, biggest duty is to nurture alternately. First the girl's mother and then the guy's mother. They go there alternately six months each to the US to take care of the children. From birth till the age of three till they are put into some institution. So there is a close bonding that develops there with the child and to keep that continuity going in the growing phase when the child does not forget the face of the grandfather or the grandmother, they have to be available on a video WhatsApp call. It used to be Skype about 10 years back. Today it's a video WhatsApp call. So my mother who is 87, she uses WhatsApp today to stay in connected with her granddaughter who is in Los Angeles. But I was off WhatsApp, just I wanted to detox myself. I was off WhatsApp for 4 months. I didn't, I didn't think I missed much. And by the way, I still am not on Facebook, I'm not on Instagram, you can't find me. The only social media I'm present in is LinkedIn, but that gives me a lot of professional connects. That's a choice. Again, it's a classic Gen X speaking. So what I'm saying is the, the opportunity to learn today is expanding with more technology. Now, if you meant, is the familial bonding reducing? Most certainly yes. But is the emotive quotient of the person changing? I think no. It's just that in India, we have traditional and, and uh, you should, uh, at some point in your life, you should read uh, the book called Business Sutra by Devdas Patnaik. So he, he brings a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, mythological concepts and traditional Indian upbringing to today's world. He compares a lot of Hindu uh, religious stories versus the Abrahamic religions as to what is happening. And one of the things that he brings about very, very clearly is that in the past in India, we have uh, we've always measured people on loyalty, commitment, uh, honesty, hard work, all the intangibles, right? The more you got connected to the world from the mid 90s, the more Western influence started happening, which meant you are looking at spreadsheets and PowerPoints. Everybody is a alphanumeric number in the US, social security number, that's it. Likewise, today you can become some number. It could be your Aadhaar, right? So what is happening is you are going to be measured only by a spreadsheet that speaks for you and not the emotions that are behind it. 
so this is where the indian companies have faced the the i would say the dichotomy dichotomy and the conflict as to how to measure them so in that sense that quotient of indian upbringing is certainly coming down and a little bit of the westernization in terms of instant gratification or the need to use technology to connect is growing up but i still think opportunities are good all the same it just could end up expanding the horizon for people of the next generation that's what i feel the, uh, the age based to discrimination uh, is very very rapid today we actually see uh, the sweet spot is 42 if you are beyond the 48 people don't give for you that's the reality when it comes to position the safety plus people say no i don't want to touch and uh, there's definitely a discrimination to be there and many of the entrepreneurs and corporate and organizations they don't openly say that but in reality that is what is happening that what you can see and the sweet spot is what for you and actually the, uh, the age earlier uh, concepts is based on the age experience now it's that is teams it's based on your potential kind of organization the kind of that as uh, the uh, technology or value you bring to the organization or the kind of uh, potential that you bring into the organization see what are you you are using uh, ceos at the age of 52 62 and today you can see a 30 year old becoming a ceo and a large company so that is uh, definitely changed between the boomers to the current uh, age uh, what we also see is This is something called as smoke barrier crisis in our industry. Uh, people exactly you see, stability is becoming a question. Uh, during their young ages, people start uh, they want to uh, experiment a lot of positions. They switch on a lot of ideas. Uh, using in, in two years, I think professor for just three years, in three years of experience, having five jobs, five organizations. And within uh, ten years, uh, people have seen ten jobs. So I just wanted to say, as a uh, it is very uh, professionals, it is very important that you also have some sense of stability in your organization. When you start an organization, spend at least two years to understand what the organization is doing, and try to learn from your peers and your uh, your managers. Try to improve your kind of uh, because that is also helps you in testing whether you are. And this it at least takes minimum two years. In two months, you clear, and two years cannot learn anything. And for that, you are doing MBAs. This two years is just a stepping stone into your actual learning starts when you get into the office, work, and not here at the college. It's just preparing you to learn your life in real professional outside the organization. So stability is becoming very very important, and you to leave a lot of opportunities. So there is career improvement, and salaries are paid in there. You take on salaries and you keep on moving. Maybe for some point of time, what happens is there is always a shift towards younger professionals. You hit a age of about say about thirty-five, thirty-seven. Then the demand for a kind of professionals you are from start. You see today, you see all this uh, pink slips which is happening out in the industry is not happening at the uh, below less than ten years. Actually, this happening for people who are the age band of about thirty-seven to forty-five. They are neither able to uh, get, uh, get into the old uh, system because that's become obsolete. Earlier, you had testing, which is becoming, and you had something called mainframes. And that is, I don't think people have heard about mainframes these days. So they are not; those technologies have become obsolete, and new technologies they are unable to get into. And as a result, these are the people. Who are losing their jobs at this age group? If you see, they would have got. I'm not. I'm talking. What is real estate? You know, you will have got a car loan. You may have a home loan. Your kid may be in your education, and all of it is there. And when a person leaves, is unable to cope up with the new technology, he loses the job at this juncture. Think about it. So stability is one. At the same time, sticking to one organization is also not seen as something which is very. Are in this. You should have a variety of organizations because people see that if you stay in an organization maybe for 10-15 years in a career, they see you may not be able to adjust to the new organization. You are very true. Very true. You're in a comfort zone. Very. You become. You get into a kind. You become the DNA of the organization. That's the reason. So that is a, that is the reason. Many people, for example, there is also a switch between uh, uh, promoter and organization, 
and events effect. Technically in India, have all the organizations are promoter and organizations. You follow the lanes or so you go to the promoter at the top. So, but then on a larger phase, if you see a promoter and organization and an MNC. Uh, I, uh, many people who come from an MNC kind of a culture and come into a promoter and organization, they fail in survey. And many people who was gone in from a promoter and organization and go, goes into an MNC at, at certain levels, fail in survey, not all. But this reason being they are unable to access them to the culture. So try and work with startups. You have an experience in startup. Have, try to work with an MNC, try to work with an Indian organization that gives you a variety. And see, at the end of the day, 10 years down the lane, you may be at milk management or you never you can be CEOs in the future. But what defines you, what kind of experiences you have taken? Too many experience, too many goods is good for nothing. So have a stability for three years in your office as a career stability. You start learning, you observe, then you start contributing to the organization. The growth is good, the organization takes two places. If you feel there is no growth for you, please move on to an organization. But the one year step you may have today, if there are a lot of jobs available, you may you may easily get an opportunity, but it's not going to hit you. It will exactly hit you beyond your 30 time. So prepare yourself. Actually, I think the three year stint is a very um, uh, moderate expectation. Uh, not just from a company perspective, but also from an employee perspective, because there's a thumb rule that the first year you spend all the time learning things from the company. Second year, you start to give back because of the experience that you have gained. And the third year is the time when you actually can start to um, grow, not, no, not just grow, but show your value to the organization and put the ball in their court. Uh, to recognize you and motivate you and value your presence. So I think the three years will also give uh, people a, a sense of uh, gratification, deep fulfillment of having achieved something. It enhances the self-esteem. And then if you are going to look for other opportunities, obviously you are going to uh, prepare yourself to be in the next level. I think that's something that's uh, very valuable that uh, came out of Vijay. We were talking of these divides earlier. We have the cultural divide, we have the socio, uh, sociological divide, we have the digital divide. Besides all of these, there's also a, a perceived divide, uh, like we they silos. We are the younger generation, they are the older generation. Now, how, I mean, every individual is different. Uh, irrespective of the, regardless of the generation, every individual is different and unique. And the multi-generation only adds to the complexity yes. of managing uh, the talent workforce. How in an organization would you actually make sure that uh, you bring about a harmony between people of various generations, they all work together with a shared vision, uh, and yet uh, go back home with a sense of fulfillment, looking forward to your Monday morning. It's not easy, right? How do you make that happen? Just any insights from your experiences? You said it right, it's never easy and um, there could be situations where people of a uh, older generation reports to people of a younger generation, right? So you do face such uh, challenges. Now, but one thing is very, very clear in organizations today that quantity does not mean quality. Just because you've spent the number of years, it doesn't mean. I, I myself at one point of time have felt I left, a, uh, left an organization and 10 years hence I met one of my ex-bosses and then I realized that that person has stagnated over time or rather the experience and the exposure that I have had. I worked for American MNCs for 15 years right? and I did Asia Pacific jobs and all that. So I felt that I have actually gathered a lot more knowledge than my ex-boss. Right? The kind of complexities that I have faced in my life are far higher. But first thing we've got to realize is that as, as a person what I try to tell people is Nobody is indispensable. Vishal Sikha had to leave one fine morning from the neighboring company. And uh, till Salim Parikh came, nothing happened. And after Salim Parikh came, also the company is running. Right? Overnight, uh, we've had situations when people had to be sent off. But companies are still running. So the first thing that I try to inculcate in the people is be humble. You or no you, 70 to 80 percent of the job will happen. Depending on the degree of uh, monotonous job actions. Right? 
whether you like it or not a good percentage of your job is monotonous repetitive you can do that again and again without without too much of cerebral involvement so first thing is that 70 80% will happen whether you are there or not there it's only about 20 25% where you make a difference as a person with your enthusiasm knowledge en- uh, your engagements your networking capability your resourcefulness all of that right so first is this is a very personal kind of a thing second thing that i also try and tell people is empathy as long as you are able to understand where the other person is coming from right that becomes a very very important criteria in your human engagement now the person might be older than you by age but it is important to give them the person the space even though he is your subordinate he or she is your subordinate and it could happen the other way the person may be younger but that does not give me the right to 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 do you know brash things right that empathy the understanding at some point of time establishing official boundaries and pulling rank is something that you've got to be conscious of so that is that's the second point that uh, i would think is important and it, it applies to all of you tomorrow one of you might start a company like right? 5 years down the line one of you might be the ceo or a promoter of a of a startup and you might have somebody who's worked 10 years in the industry like what which i just said and the person might be 5 or 7 years older than you. how would you deal with that person not saying look i'm the boss at the same time not willingly succumbing to everything that that person do or not let him hunt you right that's that's the awareness that has to come on both sides and third and most important thing is at all points of time while handling these two people we've got to be clear that in any argument there are three views in any argument there are three views your view my view and the correct view <laughs> right so long as somebody is able to position the correct view we would be able to handle situation because you need to handle the issue not the person you need to you need to you need to be conscious of that if this culture the leader is able to bring then i think the organization can succeed and where it is not we have seen enough cases of failure so that's the one thing we've got to uh, thank you dr sharma from a psychology perspective and a sociology perspective okay we now see a lot of youngsters who join the workforce they are more particular about having their private space having work from home options having flexi working options uh, all these are things that they want and they demand also whereas they should be demanded by the older generation where they have family commitments they have much more commitments than the younger workforce but that is not happening uh, whereas it should have happened ideally so what what do you think uh, is the reason from a psychology and a sociology perspective okay um as we discussed earlier one of the reason is the opportunities as uh, we rightly said and um uh, this generation is more risk taking and they don't mind uh, uh, you know and uh, another factor is the loyalty factor which we just spoke about uh, they see they're loyal to the job but they're not loyal to the organization as such right so and they want to trade their skills with the highest bidder Yeah, that's it. that's what they want. <laughs> yes, they're very practical and they're very analytical, right? And uh, they want to make the best of this life. And uh, you know, unlike uh, baby boomers and uh, Gen X, and we we little emotional, and uh, it was in our DNA in a way that uh, you know, just put by our elders uh, that we need to be loyal to the company and kind of stick there and you know, be there with them. So we we used to take on Uh, decisions emotionally maybe but this generation is they 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 know for sure what they want in terms of uh, you know, uh, the employers because uh, you know they they kind of research the market as well so at least if not more they want you know whatever the industry standard so um, and uh, this generation also gets bored faster and uh, you know so it is very and uh, and also because of uh, the digital uh, influence uh, their attention span is very less it's very has come down drastically so uh, to get them on to the job and you know to get them uh, you know uh, loyal to the company so there's a lot of work that needs to be done and a lot of psychometrics these days uh, where they assess the core competencies and core values which actually you know can align with the job the role that they want to take so there's a lot of work in terms of hr to understand them individually as well you know uh, again generalizing them is one thing and understanding them if that particular person is fit for that 
kind of a role. And coming back to your question, uh, you know, the psychologists again, the same thing is like, you know, the opportunities and uh, uh, look at this, you know, so even if a person quits a job, and there's so many banks offering the, you know, like the personal loan, like I myself have my number is on do not disturb, but still I get so many calls, like, do you want a personal loan, do you want a business loan, you know, so a lot of them, you know, don't mind living in credit cards because it's easily available. Right, so even they can take that risk, and also because there's a you know dispensable income from the parents' support, and you know they this generation is lucky in a way that you know parents are also backing them to fulfill their dreams, and uh, they want to do what they really like. So which we didn't have that kind of opportunity because you know for me I didn't have that kind of for for example my personal experience I didn't have that kind of guidance from my parents, uh, but I had to find my own course, you know through experience but they have more educated parents and you know mentors to you know to actually tell them okay go this route uh, so you know make the best of it so they they don't shy away asking you know the best of uh, um, uh, facilities and you know incentives or whatever they deserve uh, so that's i think that's about uh, the, this generation he works in boards yeah. Right. That's true. 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 Yeah. And it's like true. organizations aren't looking at they just uh, the flexible working atmosphere doesn't mean you have to work from home. You don't have to even come to office, but you can be still working from any of this so-called offices. Correct. Right. And it has become flexible Shared offices, offices, flexible living spaces. It's co-working and co-living is done. So the entire concept of uh, working itself just changed over the period of years, and it could be. Any many more changes which could be coming. Your home could become your office. If I don't have in fact, I remember a joke where uh, uh, in US, if you want to fire, my, if one organization decided to fire uh, people, so they asked them to come and work in the office. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> they were going to come to office to work. So it's happening. Yeah, and another thing that the value is freedom. You know, they want to work. They give you results, but they want to do it their own way. So they don't want anybody to impose something on them. So they really value freedom. So that's one of the reasons that you know the work from home and telecommuting is another thing with the you know flexible work hours and that they will negotiate and they'll go for stock option rather than you know yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the rewards. Uh, you know. uh, so this generation is a bit different, and they uh, as uh, we said they are socially influenced, and there's a lot of peer pressure on them. Uh, to kind of put up a very branded, you know, good look, you know, they, they're all over on social media, so they have to look good. So the offices have to look good, they have to wear branded uh, stuff, and they really, you know, that, that's influencing even media in a way. And see, what is, another thing has happened, uh, see, through the uh, media, now we know what is happening, you know, in the Ambani household, how the parties look, you know, so we know what the celebrities are doing, you know, Kim Kardashians, what they're doing, you know, so these things are also influencing them in a way that this is how we're supposed to look, this is how a relationship has to be, and this is how the work has to be, but we actually we don't know the background of it, right? So social media it just shows, you know, one side of the con, so we really don't know what's the background of it. Yeah, I think to a lot, to a large extent, I think the social media can actually mislead uh, people, not just, just generation uh, Y and Z, also the generation X, sometimes we succumb to those kind of pressures and uh, get misled. Uh, but one thing that I find, uh, I've had an opportunity to mentor few of uh, the generation Y. One thing uh, that I realize is that the small pleasures of life don't excite them anymore. Um, is it because they are grown up in an environment that has offered them a lot or um, the expectations are uh, justifiably higher because the basics are already taken care of and their expectations going forward is much at a higher plane? I mean, what do you think? And the consequence of that also is uh, they are less resilient to turbulences and hardships compared to some of the generation uh, excess and the baby boomers. So how, how do you actually analyze that? Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, the, the environment has kind of, you know, uh, made them what they are. 
uh, because they had the educated parents and parents were really you know supportive and lesser children unlike uh, our generation you know where parents had to give attention to so many children now you know the number of children have uh, come down and they want to send them to the best colleges they want to give the children the best so they have that support is there which you know early generation didn't have uh, so other than that uh, uh, what I feel is, you know, if you understand the Maslow's uh, theory of hierarchy, so if your basic needs are taken care, you know, your physiological needs and your psychological needs, next what, you know, so you start thinking higher and you know, uh, you start thinking about self-realization, self, you know, actualization. So, but also it gets very confusing to to them uh, because they're not able to understand that emptiness that they, uh, you know, feel in their hearts is to do with. Uh, maybe the, the other ways to you know fill that emptiness so people tend to fill that emptiness with materialistic things you know that's what is also happening uh, now uh, this generation is getting very materialistic you know and the uh, uh, consumerization and uh, the media and you know a lot of things have to play everybody's selling uh, you know, so many options even when you take clothes or bags or anything there's so much out, out there and uh, uh, and they want to, you know, go, you know, uh, from one brand to another one, you know, there's always a kind of competition because social media, that pre peer pressure is always there on them. Uh, that's another thing. So, what is happening is here, the basic needs are taken care of, the, so the psychological needs to an extent are taken care of. Next, now they have to get on to the next level of evolution, even consciously, you know, conscious evolution is also happening, you know. There's another uh, theory of evolution where uh, there is evolution of consciousness happens you know from early man to modern man and then you know they go on to you know become a culture hacker and then go on further from there that's how uh, even evolution of consciousness is also happening so nature also has a role to play in that uh, so this generation needs guidance more than anything else now because this um, feel of this restlessness you know cannot be filled by materialist thing alone you know because that also becomes like an addiction so now there is like shopping addiction and there is like a uh, lot of porn as an addiction a lot of things happening these days you know they're getting addicted to alcohol the substance abuse uh, so this is what they're trying to you know kind of bring down this restlessness through a lot of this extrinsic uh, factors and uh, now that, that's where psychology and uh, you know a bit of spiritual uh, you know, views come into play and uh, because now what happened, the needs get on to more of growth and contribution. So even this this generation, if you see, they are also socially inclined, they, they want to fight injustices, you know, and they, they want to hack the culture, they don't allow uh, something which is not good for our, you know, environment happening. You see a lot of them taking part in uh, those things as well. So, they're really good. I mean, there's a lot of energy there that, that has to be channeled in the right way. You know, they really need guidance in, in there. Interesting. I would like to add a point. We are talking about Zen, Y, Zen, Z, and millennials. I also see there are two types of people in every of those gens. One coming from the metros, and one coming from the non metros. And if you see, uh, there is plus and minus of both. Uh, I would see uh, a million or a Zen Z of a non-metro is still uh, is equal to Zen X. That's what we are actually seeing even in the uh, when it comes to the industry as well as family. You see, they are uh, but I don't say they are conservative, but they are kind of uh, kind of okay and adjusting and kind of uh, yes, we are humble and we are willing to learn. But what we see people from the metro, they get possibly because of all the, uh, the parents are educated and they get to know the technology and uh, there is a lot of difference between the same Zen Z Zen Z there are two kinds of people which we see and all the most said that they have got all these problems but one of the best companies of these worlds the red world which we live in are being created or started or started by the Zen X and Zen Z be it Facebook or Google or WhatsApp or many more newer technology organizations which is coming up are all promoted by uh, the new technology innovation is run by the current sets and which actually benefits the entire generation of people is what we see. Yeah, and 
if I may add a slightly contrarian point of view to your question. Uh, in our time, we believe that we were less material. But actually, given the lesser number of brands and the lesser money at our disposal, exposure. and lesser exposure, Choices. accomplishing a material purchase was a sense of achievement for us. So getting the first Maruti car was the biggest thing those days. Forget Maruti car. For getting a hero pen for me was a very big thing. It was why? Because 30 rupees. I used to write with pens which are 3 rupees. Fountain pens, 3 rupee pens. First it was 1 rupee, it became 3 rupees. Camelin pen was 3 rupees. A hero pen, so called gold table, there used to be lots of fancy words floating around. Getting that pen for 30 rupees used to be my first rank gift. Yeah, my, my dad gave this to me and I used to use it only during exam time because if you use it during other times it becomes old. Right? So that, but by the way, it's a material thing. You expected a reward for a, so I think that's it's human nature to be materially inclined or have a material gratification for what you've done and I don't think this generation is any different. We easily ascribe that to them and on the contrary, while we say that a lot of I me myself has come in because of the western influence, it is wanting the right thing for I me myself which has enabled them to rise up against social wrongdoings. Now, which means if their I, me, myself is helping create a social awakening, I don't mind that. Whereas my social thinking of the past, I was confined to my family. I was happy saying, I created a good life for myself. I secured the life of my children and grandchildren. I earned for them for the next 20 years. I can retire peacefully. That was more I, me, myself than this I, me, myself. So I think we tend to use a few things a little loosely with, with, to the point that it becomes an indictment against the current generation, which I think it is not. Yeah, you're right. I most certainly think it is not. Because these people are as, I would say to your question, they are as excited by a small appreciation for what they have done as I am. They are as excited about getting that reward from their father or their mother for something that they have done as much as I am. They like to have that social recognition, which is why, you know, there's this popular joke, right? And I wanted to follow Facebook in my real life. So I went around walking saying what I had in breakfast before breakfast this morning. And what did I do? What is my son doing? And there are three people following me already. The police, the mental hospital and whatever, right? So that joke is there. But the social recognition is what they seek from all this simply because they like that, that appreciation. So psychologically, they're not very different from our generation. It's just the manifestation is slightly different because of the resources that are available, right? So if you're able to understand this starting point of theirs, it doesn't matter a Gen X and maybe a gen Generation yeah, Z. Totally. And by the way, ma'am, I still say Gen Z, not Gen Z. <laughs> because I am still English United Kingdom, not American. <laughs> uh, to add to that, uh, that's rightly said, the intrinsically human beings are same. And you know, the psychological needs, emotional needs, you know, spiritual needs, and intrinsically they are all the same. But you know, we are all uh, kind of, you know, uh, nurtured and conditioned in our own environments. And also because of uh, options that are available, you know, this is like, uh, you know, spoiled for choice, you know, that's where they tend to get, you know, kind of lost. So that's where, you know, we need to guide them, you know, that is another thing that's required, you know, at that part. Uh, but otherwise, you know, as you rightly say, intrinsically, you know, all human beings are same. We're just trying to understand certain characteristics so that, you know, it will really help us understand and give them, you know, more, you know, provide them what they really need. Yeah. But I, I don't want to, I don't want to forget one point that, uh, Shama said though, there is a lot of um, uh, fancy about weekend parties. You can go and stand on the streets of Indranagar this evening from 7 o'clock. You know what I'm talking about. I That's something that I completely disagree with the current generation on. Right? I, and people say that IT industry has spoiled it. Take it from a man who has spent 30 years in the IT industry and is a pure teetotaler. And I still do my puja three times in a day. So it's, it's not impossible. Most of the battles are won here. So that is a very, very destructive phenomenon that's catching hold of people today, right? And there are certain things which I, which I believe are okay. For example, baby boomers did not care about any form of exercise because their daily routine, walking, non-availability of metros and buses and taxis and all that, they had to walk a lot. So their lifestyle was different. A Gen X, for me, it was a combination. And over a period of time, I started getting used to sedentary life. So I'm adjusting to some level of walking. 
For example, I don't climb stairs at all. I, I don't go through the lift at all. I only climb stairs. It's just that I was brought by the lift here, but I would have preferred to come up the staircase, right? So I, I find my own rhythm. So it is good for Gen X. Now, if you take any of the millennials, what they love is running. How many of you want to run marathon? Full marathon? Half marathon, right? This, this spread will not be there in my generation, right? So I identify with all that because given the sedentary lifestyles and given the fact that we are not able to do a lot of physical work that was being done in the past, I understand that this is becoming a necessity and I can identify with that. But the, the rest of it is not something that I can, I can uh, identify with. And if people of this group are able to take this advice and if you're able to propagate it to 2, 3, 4, 5, 20 people beyond you, I think I would have left India better. So, message for you. So I think uh, all of you mentioned uh, materialistic pleasures multiple times. Uh, mm -hmm. So connecting that to the topic that we have in hand uh, about the workforce and reward system, compensation system. Uh, what we observe is that there are standard HR policies in any organization which are uh, more connected to levels, designations rather than each. So, you know, what are your opinion? Open to all. Uh, should it not be connected to the age? Because my expectation at my age for a reward would be completely different from what maybe they would expect at their age. Right? Um, forget the monetary value of that. I may not enjoy going to a resort and partying. Uh, I would rather be happy with a big voucher. So, it depends on person to person. And it changes uh, again with age. So, don't you think that change is much needed in organizations? Uh, see, I think uh, the entire uh, discussion is based on ideas in industry. There are also other industries. Right. Uh, and services, retail, pharma, education. A lot of changes have been happening in these industries. But obviously, IT has been forefront. I see this as actually this change has already happened in the services industry where the rewards yes. are getting customized. It's not that standard, it's in fact it's no more age based, actually speaking. It's no more experience based. It's purely based on performance. In your team, you will have a finance head with cloud there. I mean, I've seen organizations where you do you have a finance person at the top. No. In a project you have a finance. If for a project you have a HR, if for a project you have a supply chain type, and these will be the varied value, varied experience, and various functions. So the concept of the age or experience is already quite broken, at least in services industry per se. In, in the typical manufacturing construction industry, it will still take longer time to come. So I strongly, strongly believe this has actually changed. Though gone are the days that you are, you are, you got a P5 to P20 salary scale, you have to be only in the salary scale, you will not be able to promote you. That's a close problem. Today, there's a lot of exposure you perform. You are not able to get into this project. Yes, we move to another project or move to an international location. So, uh, so I, 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 to answer your question, this is already in place in the industry for any At least in certain industries. I think most of the rewards are linked to for want of anything else, a grade. And a grade is nothing but a broad approximation of the job role that you perform. So any reward or perk is associated to that job role that you perform. And there is a range of, uh, you know, I would say the reward limit. So once you stay in the job role, you are expected to perform certain activities. And as a result of which, you need to benefit from a few things. That is already defined. Now, where it comes to spot awards and, and discretionary awards, the manager is vested with a lot of discretion. And if not, the manager can put up to the to the uh, further management beyond the person to be able to apply that discretion in favor of the person. So I think that flexibility is coming. It's in varying degrees in varying industries, though, depending on the, the size of the, the, the manpower as well as the complexities involved, how much of it is knowledge capital versus how much of it is is physical material work that they do. And that's the kind of difference that I see, but I think sooner than later it will catch up. Sure. Dr. Shama, you want to 
Uh, well, we have already seen uh, the companies are gearing up uh, to the uh, new workforce that is coming. They want to make the workplaces fun. And, uh, you know, as uh, Sridhar rightly said, the places look so different. They look vibrant with colors and, you know, the you know, flexible uh, working opportunities and everything. So, but what HR would do is, you know, uh, keeping in mind of uh, this uh, different generation of workforce that they have, they can create like a bucket of uh, uh, these uh, different uh, rewards and uh, uh, opportunities for them. So, uh, you know, according to the ranks, uh, that this can be selected. So, at least can, they can give different choice. Like there is a stock option, then there is, you know, cash reward, or there is a holiday. You know, they, these kind of a thing, they can kind of create a bucket. So, you know, the, uh, the employees can choose from. So, that can also ease up a lot of, uh, this, you know, uh, HR uh, engagement team, you know. Um, can benefit from that. And that's what I think that's a fantastic point. Selecting you won the award, now you decide <laughs> yeah, the bucket yeah, so what you want to pick up. Options, so that's yeah, what it's, they, they it's, like to it's beginning to it's beginning yes. to yeah. uh, come through. And uh, uh, Shida, this is a question or a suggestion. So, like personally, think, uh, the HR as a concept yeah. is moving away. Yeah. It's become a people function. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was just a general. You see, the HR people functions to be done only by the HR team, or is it by the entire people? Is it this people management? Because in at least in the services industry, there is no procurement. The entire procurement is nothing but people. The entire investment is nothing but people. So, how do you use? Because it's very important because people are also going to come to the industry. So, what is he as a leader? You as a leader, you really think that the involvement of leaders. Uh, management because people function with everybody, anybody, and everybody is becoming part of people. So it is not restricted only to HRP per se to manage this. True. So, very good point. See, every person has to deal with people and machines today. Yeah. Right? So, every person's role inherently involves handling people. Yeah. And I mentioned this before empathy. The, the empathy and the involvement can, can come only from the people in the nearest vicinity, which is either the manager or a project leader who need not be your direct manager. You are a part, of, like you said, there's a procurement person sitting in the project. He reports to procurement, but he's a part of the project all the same. Yeah. And the project manager becomes is, is sort of a virtual manager, right? So it's only those people who can bring the sensitivity of the situation. What HR function is, is becoming is, it's, it's becoming a sort of a conscience keeper. HR function becomes a sort of a, a guideline provider. It's like it's like what RBI is to the banks. Every bank has to perform their function, but RBI gives you the guidelines. HR gives you the guidelines stating, I'm going to provide you with this basket of options, like uh, what Dr. Dr. Shama said. These basket of options are available to you to choose from. Now, I apply the discretion every single day, stating, do I want to reward the person for being bold and taking an initiative, or going out of the way and performing a certain role, or being considerate to a fellow employee, or was, uh, I would say, uh, very inclusive in the behavior, whether it is gender inclusive or class inclusive or whatever, whether the person has done it. So I have the discretion in choosing from a bouquet of reasons where I can give the reward to the person too. And so that I think is, is the job of every manager. So every person has to deal with people and it is not just managers, by the way. People who are in the team, tomorrow you may become a part of the team. You have to handle your managers, you have to handle your peers, you have to handle your peers' managers as well. Because a feedback from a peers' manager is going to be adverse on you. Right? So what I strongly believe is technical, yes. Technology, your education, your experience, your background, the kind of colleges that you pass out. The most important skill of every successful person, manager, leader, CEO, is people management. Absolutely. How strong you are in your people skills. How strong you are good at connecting the relations, creating a relationship with your manager, your peer, and at the 360 degree. That is what is going to take you to a better leader. What I say is suggestion. Yeah, I think uh, this continuation of what you mentioned, uh, HR, HR as a department is more a felicitator, facilitator rather, rather than calling the shots okay. and yeah. drawing rules and regulations. I think they have to be more of listeners rather than uh, talkers so that they create the right ambience for people to come and share their concerns or uh, or their hardships or the difficulties and then use that feedback in a very positive way to create a better working environment for them.
for the employees. Absolutely. Can we open up uh, for the Q&A session? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Shridhar sir for establishing an equality between generation X and Y. Uh, as he rightly said that even given provided with an opportunity, even Gen X would have been the same as Gen Y. Absolutely. Yeah. <coughs> and also, I would like to um, clear it out like um, getting jobs uh, those days when it comes to the example of my own mother. She used to say when I passed residency, her father had shouted to the entire village saying that uh, there is no difference between my surking as well as my daughter because she has passed her residency and she has reached a certain level. And uh, passing SSLC was the biggest thing during those times. But now, as you say, there is a peer pressure on the uh, generation that where people have been treated as a work machines now. So there are night shifts, there are morning shifts, which are uh, what changing the metabolism rate of metabolism rate, biological cycle of the people. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so do you think it is a problem of a generation or it is the problem of the organization which is imposing so much of pressure? You want me to answer that? Okay. Um, at a broader level, it's a problem for developing countries. Because we've never never said no. I, I realized this in the first phase, I would say in the 90s, that we just took on all that we could. Because we wanted more dollars, we wanted more jobs, we wanted more exposure, we wanted to get even with the world. Right? In the mid 2000s, when I was when I was in various uh, MNC companies, I would say no if a call is being sent in the night. I would say no, saying if or we get even. I do one call uh, in my off hours. The next call will be during your off hours. I am not going to be available. And, and for example, you take any MNC company, talk to your people who were uh, whom you know. Anybody who is working for an MNC company, today is 14th of December, in 10 days from now, sorry, 6 days from now, you will have emails from the CEO which says happy holidays. How many of us enjoy holidays during that time? All of us will do backup for some other people who follow Christmas and we will be the backups for them stating, oh, when somebody is not answering, my backup is so and so. Because we have led ourselves into that position. Now, I maintain the discipline even today. Let me give you two or three things which you will not find with executives of today like me. Number one, when I close my laptop on a Friday night, I open only on Monday morning. And I have never worked over the weekends unless there is an absolute grave necessity the sky is going to fall. For the company. This never happens. <laughs> for the company. That's why I qualify. For the company. Number two. Number two. You see everybody fidgeting with their mobile phones. Yes, I did too. When I received some calls which kept on ringing, I found if somebody is in an urgency, I picked up my phone. But otherwise, you still feel people sitting in a, in a meeting. You would find people fidgeting with their phones and looking for an email. I have never used emails on my mobile phone. Never. You will find people saying, oh, you know what, I had to approve. Yeah, I belong to a generation where I did not even have a PC. All of us had a shared PC. One PC for the office where an email was taken as a printout and given to me. I come from that era. I don't believe anything, anything demands that attention that it cannot wait. And if something cannot wait, it means somebody else has faulted in not planning for themselves. So back to your question. The pressure that is coming up is partly because we have created this model of working around the clock. India, Philippines, now even Bangladesh. We have led ourselves into this situation where some part of it I don't think we can get out of. Until the time this tag of developing countries is there, we will need to live with it. Which is why I think the one change that companies are bringing about now is that they shift people across the different shifts. For example, there is a morning 6 to afternoon 2 shift which is this side. North uh, Asia, Australia, New Zealand. And then there is a day shift which is closer our time zone. They start at about 9 o'clock or so, 8.30 or 9 or even 9.30 and they go until about 7 o'clock which is closer to our time zone. And then there is a third shift which starts at 8 in the night or 10 in the night which goes on till next morning. So the, the day is, uh, is broken into three shifts of 8 hours each. 6 to 2, 2 to 10, 10 to 6. So people are rotated across shifts. As much as how air hostesses get their uh, time off, right? They get a day and a half off if they spend a full day in, the, in, the, in, in air, right? So likewise, 
that change is coming which is point number 1 point number 2 the point, the thing that you made about pressure i think half of it is work related half of it is what you said psychology related because people who have not kept themselves current with the technology today what happens is let's say easily identifiable is it and bpo industry because those were the the those were sucking manpower like a big time in the last 15 20 years right when you begin to work you are maybe an agent at a call center or you are probably a coder five years later you and, and because of the shortage of people in three years you started handling a team of seven people and in 15 years you were you, sorry in seven years you were a second level manager handling seven managers who each handled 15 people you were running a 100 member organization so you ended up signing vouchers rather than creating codes so you are in that place not because you can sign the vouchers you are there because you bring some value people lost sight of that value with the result that when you become 15 years uh, experience cognizant and infosys and the others putting together 25000 cvs are in the market now 25000 yeah and they are all not employable again right so part of the pressure that you talked about is how you keep yourself current and at the beginning uh, vijay spoke about abcd right right analytics and big uh, data cloud big data cloud, cloud digital. Digital. Uh, digital and security after 30 years in the industry i now lead cloud digital transformation and security business for a company as a vice president i kept myself current i don't fear job losses right so technology should scare you the usage of technology should not so as long as you are able to keep yourself current a part of the work related pressure or the peer related pressure will itself vanish because what you study is only useful in the first few years nobody cares what i study today right so that is the second part of the the challenge the first part is we have led ourselves into this but live with it rotations are happening second part of it is the societal uh, kind of pressure because i might lose my job third is what you want to do with your career because many of us at some point of time begin to feel where am i headed so the one thing that you need to remember is the the when you when you go want to go from <coughs> here to the other side across a river you all of us would have studied this in physics right i want to go to the other f a i f i m board but if the river is moving left to right i begin uh, going from here i would end up on the other side because you end up moving that happens you know everybody's career including mine i've seen so many changes in my career you i've shifted goal posts or changed directions don't fear that while you do that for sustenance and survival and excellence don't lose sight of your passion at at my age today i am studying doctorate i have not given up on what my passion is i have not given up on what my calling is so as long as you are able to identify what's your calling in life and you don't want to lose sight of it like what dr kalam says dream is not what comes in your sleep dream is something that does not let you sleep keep that burning fire inside you so if you do these things three things right the rest of the pressure does not matter thank you so much concern uh, of the growing stress levels and also the night shift that people do and the effect that it has on the health uh, in the yeah so to that i think all that started with the outsourcing as the developing countries took up a lot more projects because they want to progress it was all about uh, money you know and dollars uh, but i think you know here are the labor laws you know the policies can really make a shift here because see when we see that the research is showing some of these jobs are like night shifts you know are actually affecting the health so much and you know yes, it is going to burden you know the families with such you know medical expenses and it's really you know having such kind of detrimental effects so why don't uh, the labor laws you know make such guidelines you know we don't need such kind of dollars isn't it and also it is in our hands to you know to say tomorrow if you get a good salary and you know it is uh, like affecting your health adversely it is in your hands like he rightly said so to say no to set jobs you know i think the problem is the problem is it, it is as much at a person level as at a country level the problem is if not you there's somebody else yeah, that's right. as long as that fear is there you never say no and one more thing that's, that's the problem one more thing is night shift is something is not in the police nurse driving there's so many other industries which has been doing for ages for my very good point. that is the reality very good point in reality you see the percentage of people in it is just about 20% 
because at eighty percent there is still people still do a lot of time checks. Okay. And thanks to the uh, if, because of the ID digit, I believe it's, it's getting numbers. noticed. It's yes. getting noticed and it's getting addressed. <laughs> yes. So far, this true, true. this night concept of night shift was ignored. Yeah. The people in this industry are really suffering for it. Thank you all for this wonderful discussion. But I just have a question related to the empathy that we're talking about now. As a teacher, I have a concern. Um, as a teacher, we teach a class of sixty. All sixty are not on the same confidence level. We have to cater to students who are faster learn, fast learners, slow learners, and we know how to cater to them and how to. How tolerant or how empathetic is the workplace for them? Now all of them are going to go into companies. All of them are going to get new jobs. So my concern is, will they be given time for them to catch up with the rest? All because today I think the entire workforce is all companies are more about your efficiency and your performance. So there's a lot of pressure on them. There's a lot of pressure on being, you know, the best performer or there is a benchmark or the what is it? So there could be a Many of them who cannot reach that fast, not that they can't, but it might take them time. So, how much of a tolerance level will be there from the company as such? Because I'm not from the corporate, so I really don't know what the picture is the other okay. side. Let me take that. Um, I'll give you one one fundamental difference, right? And uh, this is more in a lighter note. But the fact is, the students here in the school, in the college, they pay to come and sit here. So the teacher is duty bound to take care of all the people and bring a certain level of equality in the education where the teacher inadvertently spends more time with a student who is below average because you want to bring him or her up to the same level. This is this is this life. In corporate life, they are paid to come and sit there. So the manager and the organization has a right to demand a certain level of work from them. So that makes the posture completely different, which is point one. Point number two is, I would rather spend more time with my top performer. You know why? Because he's the most vulnerable person. I might lose him fast because my competitor is also watching him. If I don't take care of him, somebody else will. The same thread that I told her that if, if, if I don't do the job, some other country is going to. Likewise, if I don't take care of that person, somebody else will. So I have to satisfy his appetite. I have to first, like I said earlier, we would appreciate them, even for the smallest of things, give them the right kind of ammunition to work, recognize them for what they are doing, give them additional project tasks, which sets them up on a career path whereby I am able to take the person from just an individual contributor to maybe a, 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 a innovator, if he's more technically inclined or if he's more managerially inclined or business inclined, give him a role of a business ownership. I need to build that path along with my team member. And to the earlier question that Vijay asked, it's the building a career is not just HR's job. It's the job of the person with the manager. And I have a role to play with my top performer as well. So I would spend a high amount of time on my top performer for fear that I should not lose. At the same time, the bottom performers shape up or shape out. It can be as ruthless as that. It can be as ruthless as that. But it is it's a little unsympathetic in that sense. Now, where I'm okay with is if a person, despite giving the right amount of, uh, I would say, support and the extent of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, leverage on time, if we're able to do that, then if the person doesn't shape up, it's the person's fault. On the other hand, where I disagree with is, you had six levels of interviews to hire a person just because the company has not done well because of bad management decisions to just say one fine morning i've had enough of you thank you very much you take two months pay and get out is not something that i can identify with so that's where being unsympathetic and ruthless i draw the line yeah, thank you for the honest answer i just want to add to that as you rightly said you know uh, for companies it's all about targets and profit so they're not actually going to look at like they want the best talent and you know so there's so many rounds of interviews is like you know assessments and after that only the candidates comes in and, uh, but you know um, i understand and you know you you seem to be a very empathetic person and, and as a teacher you want your uh, you know students to excel you know and for, in your eyes and everybody is same and you want everybody to do well so but what you could do here is like see you have to understand 
each individual will have certain weakness and certain strengths. So even uh, those, in the, you know, the candidates, the students who are not performing well, but they, they do have certain strengths, you know, very strong on certain areas, right? Maybe technical and non-technical. So you need to identify those and, you know, it's always better to work on the strengths, yeah, you know, and you kind of, you know, train them better on the strengths so that they can take up uh, something, you know, which aligns to their strengths. So they have better opportunities in that area. So I think you can play, you know, a big role here and, you know, getting them onto the next level. Sure. I think that's the right way to look at it. Empathy helps you delve into the situation. Task orientation helps you do what is right for the organization. Because you are paid to do what is right for the organization. Don't forget that. Right? Empathy helps you understand the starting point of the person. Task orientation allows you to take the right decision for the situation. Now, as long as you are able to maintain that balance, there are times. For example, somebody's mother is unwell, admitted into hospital, not able to come to office, was not able to put a leave request in the system. I would be empathetic and I would let it go. Somebody was having a jolly good time in Goa on, along the beaches and uh, got stuck in, uh, on the way back, got stuck in uh, torrential rains while driving back and could not make it to office. I apply discussion there and I say, I'm going to demand that that, that day is a leave for you. There's a difference between the two. That's what I'm saying. But in, in, any spectrum, well, in any spectrum, where should we uh, be more empathetic and where should I not be empathetic? You mean as a, a, a manager or as a person? As in, a person. In, in, as a person in your personal life or in your professional life? Professional. Professional life. In your professional life, right? Uh, so you see, like if you're a manager, for example, you be, you see that if your empathy is going to help that person in the long run. See, as a manager, what's your, what's your role? Is to mentor that person, right? So if you see that if it's going to help that person in the long run, be what you want him to be, so you can be empathetic. Otherwise, you need to be tough in certain situations, right? Right? I think it's more about emotional intelligence. You know, if you study the subject of emotional intelligence, so you'll understand when to, you know, it's also about decision making. You know, what's right in that moment. You know, it all depends on the scenario, right? What's right in that moment. And you know, I'm keeping the you know bigger goals in mind. Empathy helps you put yourself into the other person's situation. That's all. But we still have a goal to accomplish. I just have one line to add. That's going to clarify. Uh, when we say you have to be empathetic, it doesn't mean that we have to be sympathetic to the person, <laughs> right? It's different. Yeah. Empathy is being uh, right. Uh, Sridhar rightly mentioned. Put yourself in the shoes of the other person. Understand uh, how he would react to what you would say or do, and then use that uh, to validate your own actions. So it doesn't it doesn't actually draw a judgment, but it gives you a tool to evaluate the situation and do the best that you can. Please. I think as a manager, it is also equally important when you are empathetic or even sympathetic to do a fact validation first. So people come up with hundreds of problems every day. So as a manager, you cannot be empathetic and sympathetic with each person, depending on the seriousness of the situation and validation of the facts that, uh, or the points that the person has raised, and then you come arrive at a, a certain decision, right? So that I think there is no simple, straightforward answer. Whether spectrum ka this side or spectrum ka that side, it has to be depending on situation. It's a judgment call. Basically. I'll give another example. Let's say somebody lands in a situation where he has to be given the pink slip. Now, empathy helps you understand why your manager did that. Don't hold it against your manager. Right. He has done it because there was a compulsion from the organization. I have had such situations. But I am the only leader who could stand up and say I have not sacked people unceremoniously. That's a record that I have maintained in my career. Right. But it amounts to understanding the situation where that pressure comes on a person to say that you are 28 people. You've got to bring it down to 14. That means 50% of the team has to go because 50% of the budget has been cut. Empathy allows you to understand the situation. But task orientation will make you accept it. If it were only empathy, you would disagree with the decision. But the task orientation as an employee, as a person at the receiving end, will help accept. So many a time, you may not agree with the decision, but you still have to accept. So empathy helps you understand the situation and 
identify yourself where you are and helps you disagree but task orientation allows you to accept it and move on in your life because you know going to get the set the clock back it's done is done so you got to move on that is acceptance of the reality and moving on that is task orientation yeah true to that you know uh, you have to do the task you have to give a thing slip right but empathy is just going one step maybe you can refer that person elsewhere see what you can do that exactly. for that person good point. that is empathy right i mean just going one point good point there. good point the manager manager could still help refer the person to various people are yeah do something for this guy good team member of mine right and even there to your earlier question i would refer see the problem is it's the good guys who end up leaving so i would refer the good guy or or a deserving guy to somebody rather than a lesser performer right so show that empathy yeah, empathy also re- uh, is recognition that this could impact the other people in the organization yeah. and structure your process accordingly exactly yeah. empathy brings the yeah. human element to work right Simply. i strongly believe that's, it is necessary that's the single strong line so we couldn't have asked for more Excuse more me. okay i'm just no sorry we did like uh, if i take to shut them uh, that shut them sir Uh, at 35 so how do you manage your counsel mid career mid career so mid career crisis i think the mid-career. the the window of mid life crisis is is moving downwards in age right in in uh, baby boomers age it was about 45 48 right and there was a there was a joke those days when i i started my career i was told that in the 7th year you buy your first house right by the 20th year you invest in your second house and that means it's your retirement retirement investment because 15 years later when you retire you start working at about say 23 or so 20 years of experience and you're at about 43 you retire at 55 58 those days the the line was shifting so that means you end up uh, uh, in a situation where you're almost there or your retirement benefits by way of pf gratuity etc will help you settle that loan and you are settled for life that that's the sort of thing and hence at that 43 45 48 they were in a situation of having to make a decision either invest in the second house continue my loyalty or i have to put it in remain to my kids education or is the company that i am working for going to continue i don't know any other company i don't know any other industry that used to be the midlife crisis point now i think with a shrinking lifetime of companies of jobs of people and the the loss of interest with a lot of people 35 30 33 becomes the first becomes the first uh, crisis i wouldn't call it midlife though it's there is an early life crisis as well that's the time when a person has to make a decision i and i i believe in looking at it as maybe two three different capsules the first capsule is when you've finished your first phase and you're looking at am i heading in in the right direction and i want to move that's a crisis point do i take a different function do i continue in the same function do i probably take a managerial job or do i shift industry i have had people from hotel management industry who moved to it and the person is now doing extremely well in a facilities management so there's no one industry that he is being part of so that's that's one phase the second phase second phase is when you're at about 43 45 if you notice many people who have worked and then become entrepreneurs they've all done it at the age of 33 to 37 so i think that's the first crisis point the second uh, phase is when you're 45 47 and to the point that was made earlier will i get a job elsewhere i pass through it sometime right like, will i get a job elsewhere at this age will they absorb me i can be a consultant to a startup but i cannot be an employee at a startup right so you got to contend with that reality and that's the time you realize that you are not in jobs like like what your parents were or your grandparents were which gave you a steady after job income be it a pension or be it a be it a, a rent or something else that gave you a steady income post your retirement what do i do in the next 10 years where i invest for myself and my wife because by then your kids are already getting to college right they are already 15 16 17 they are getting into college what do i do in the next phase which invest for myself that's the second crisis that hits a person at all points of time first thing is stay current and define your direction second is bring that much of economic security that is required at any point of time in today's world people say ensure that you have a 6 month balance in your life in your bank or in liquid instruments where you're able to survive the next 6 months till you get the next job suddenly one fine morning something happens you at least have a 6 month cover that's the second thing bring bring at least that much of economic uh, uh, security third one is in the process of looking at uh, what is needed for you for your career be conscious that you're doing what is right 
for the next generation. That comes in at the at the uh, at the time when you have your first crisis. That's the time the person probably has a first child, a toddler. What are you doing to invest for that person? So these are three things that you've got to. First is your current status. Keep yourself current on whatever you're working on. Second is about bringing that much of economic security. Third is what you're doing for the family. As long as you get this balance, the crisis will will be blown far easier. Anything else? Yeah, I don't know. yeah, he just wants to add a point. Uh, see, as far as the career crisis is concerned, uh, what I personally see is, uh, as uh, Sridhar said, stay relevant. You are, you cannot close your eyes and oblivion to the fact that nothing is going to happen. Please be prepared to the worst, the worst never happens. But do things the right way, prepare yourself, always uh, have a strong network, not just inside the organization, also the organization, because it's important network that is going to take you to the next level. Uh, your college, your peers, your uh, seniors, your colleagues, that is all because many have got placed just because of network. So, have a strong network in place, again, it comes to relations, people relations. So, that is something which you should have uh, focus on. And also, keep updating your uh, industry, what is happening out in the industry. And uh, this is something the outside the, uh, this discussion. When you lose a job, this would come to you in some point of time. I wish it doesn't come to any point of time to anybody. But at times, when you lose a job, please prepare an Excel sheet of all your clients, your customers, your vendors, your friends, your colleagues, your alumni, your superiors, and your bosses, your reporters. These are the people who are going to take you to the next opportunity. So just to uh, sum up. There was one other question. Oh, one more? One more. Okay. Uh, so you spoke, it's not to personal, but uh, you spoke about the uh, yeah, clear differences between personal life and professional life. Like, do uh, not open the laptop after uh, Friday evening. Do you think that is something that every employee at every level should follow? Because we are seeing uh, many people that put themselves into work too much that uh, they harm uh, their personal relationships or uh, things like that. Uh, is that something would would, uh, would which would make me a good uh, manager or a good better professional uh, rather than uh, you know just say uh, uh, how much ever I work that uh, that much uh, I would be earning. Uh, sir also said that learning uh, you learning only starts uh, at when you enter the company. This is just a preparing a point for us. So you said if I would uh, what would you, uh, I be doing if I regret missing out on something on those two days? I I just close the laptop. What would happen uh, if like that? To be frank, you do all this learning, learning, whatever it is for your family. The first priority is your family. So focus, you have to ensure that you give time to your family, but you make them understand that there are typical scenarios. So please make them understand, yes, this is the scenario, please help. But work is important in life, but work is part of life, work is not life. Your family is priority and you have to spend time with So, um, I went through this transition about 20 years back, okay? Um, initially, I used to think that will I miss something, but the chances to miss, miss something was far lesser those days because we were living in a lesser connected world. When I had my first son, that was the time I moved, uh, I, I was working there in Delhi, uh, and uh, I'm a South Indian, so I had to come back to uh, see my child and all that. Initially, even those days, I would grab that one hour of time to work. But over time, I realized that when, when my son first started walking or when my first son first ate something, I missed that part, part and that is that I lost forever, right? So in 2003, if I remember right, when, when we used to come down south, what I did was I used to carry my laptop bag with me. I would keep it in front of me and I would not touch it. It was the sternest test I put for myself. I keep it in front of me, will not open the laptop. Right? That gave me the... And then when I went back, I would have some 180, 200, 300 kind of mails. I mean, it varied with the varied level of responsibility that I had. But then I realized that there are small things which tend to get escalated just because they want an instant answer. <clears throat> and 7 out of 10 times, not all 10, 7 out of 10 times, the issue was that 
somebody was unprepared or somebody forgot to send that email to you or somebody was so engrossed in something else so once i learned to separate that even now there are times when i have to work or for example i attended a event for example in uh, in uh, delhi and i have to come back home but saturday morning i have got to be somewhere i have taken a midnight flight i am going to take one next week next right i am going to take a midnight flight to get back home so it does it does hamper my personal time but all i am saying is <coughs> excuse me so the point that you made about am i going to miss something or am i going to get more for what um, uh, uh, extent of work that i do i don't think that's the right point as a person as a uh, as a employee you have a certain task to be accomplished within a certain point of time so long as you are able to able to face yourself face your conscience at the end of the day and tell yourself i have earned my salary for the day you don't have to fear anything not your bosses not your parents not your family you are just answerable to your conscience tell yourself that you earned your salary for the day you have completed your task for the day supposing you were not able to do it for whatever reasons there is no harm in using your personal time because you have used your official time or your official work uh, purpose you were not able to accomplish something either just because you probably did not have the mood for it that day you were not able to concentrate and midnight after 11 o'clock you were able to spend that two two hours and concentrate on something in an undisturbed environment go ahead and do it but it is entirely personal as to where you want to draw the line and how do you want to do it but compulsively looking at a email over the weekend is not something that i would subscribe to compulsively wanting to bring yourself into office work let me let me ask you a question we don't hesitate to work for 2 hours on a saturday on a call yeah ek call le le yaar please that that will be the request that same that same liberty have anybody all- allowed you that time to say on a working day at 11 o'clock you go and stand in the queue to get your aadhar card registered or get your uh, passport renewed do you or don't you feel guilty so there is a book called the seven day weekend please read the book it will tell you it will tell you how you've got to balance this and it is entirely personal now if i am working on a saturday i will not hesitate to go for a for a for, a, for a standing in a queue at 11 o'clock in the morning i would say i'm not available for the next two hours but as long as i'm able to balance the time and the two hours worth that i am making the company lose for my sake i find either an alternate time or i overdo during some other time you are above board that is the balance that you've got to bring that's what i meant by saying see this is <coughs> weekend i don't touch my laptop is more of a i would say a a figurative state but what i accomplish otherwise is actually the material important state and that is your responsibility to the organization right so ensure that you do what the organization expects you to do but don't ever think putting excess hours and there are a lot of people who i can tell you examples there are one set of people who if the boss is in town they'll be in office at 8:45 in the morning and if the boss is sitting up to 8 o'clock in the night they will sit up to 8 o'clock in the night because they want to be seen as working which is one second is there are many people who i know you won't even believe this would ensure that they would send a mail at 11 o'clock in the night say eh? yeah the last night at 11 o'clock i sent you the mail meaning oh i worked at 11 in the night and you did not respond to me don't get into all these compulsions don't get into all these pressures because these are all acting some people are busy some people are acting in fact you can go against them that they are not able exactly. to organize the time exactly. right? so some people are working hard some people are hardly working so differentiate the two and maintain your balance all i'm saying is you are your judge and ultimately i i i subscribe to the point what vijay vijay said completely when you are there or not there the company <laughs> company moves on when you are there or not there the only people who suffer are your family so your first loyalty is to your family loyalty still exists today but not in the context of the company in the context of your family your first loyalty is your fam- is your fa- to your family the rest of it throw loyalty out of the window throw it out of the window the my boys so if i may wind up uh, managing a multi generation workforce is uh, less of a challenge after listening to so many valuable insights and more of an excitement i would say and there are valuable uh, lessons i think that uh, we have we can take away from this session and there are lessons across generations because today's generation z is going to be generation y tomorrow and then a generation uh, x after 
So I think there are valuable lessons that we have learned. One is respect for each other, I think, is, the, is at the heart of any relationship. Uh, empathy for each other and empathy for the situation is very important. And the third, pro third point probably is uh, learn to work in a collaborative way rather than as a command and uh, follow uh, principle. And network. And network. networking. I think that was a very, very valuable uh, input that uh, Vijay had shared. Please. Just curious. If this generation is Generation Z, what are we going to call the next generation? <laughs> anyway, somebody else's problem. <laughs> Maybe, no, 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 they'll find it. They'll find it. Come back to A. Come back to A. Uh -huh. Why did they start at X though? <laughs> the X factor. Yeah, the X factor. The X factor. So, thank you very much to all the panelists for uh, sparing valuable time and uh, sharing insights. It was very useful. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you.